You're listening to the Fit Mind, Fit Body podcast, where we explore the connection between running and positive mental health. We do this by talking to runners from all walks of life who generously share their experiences with us. So you don't miss an episode, I've created an email list for you to join. Check the show notes for more details. Without further ado, I'm your host, Michelle Frost. Let's get moving. Welcome to this episode of the Fit Mind Fit Body Podcast. Today is a flashback episode. This is because I'm away from my office for a few weeks and so I'm not doing as many interviews. So I hope that you'll enjoy this episode from way back in March 2022 with the amazing Ben Wells as he shares his absolute passion for exploring Tasmania on foot. Enjoy. Welcome to Fit Mind Fit Buddy. Today we get to talk to the wonderful Ben Wells, which who many of you, I think, at least in northern Tasmania, if not most of Tasmania, will know. Those of you who live overseas, you may not know Ben. Uh, but Ben, welcome. It's so good to have you here. Thank you, Michelle. Great to be here. <laughs> I've, I've known Ben for a few years, and um, to say that this gentleman does not stay still would be an understatement. <laughs> it's just seems to be always moving and always out having adventures. So this is going to be a very interesting conversation. But before we get into that, tell me a little bit about where Ben Wells began. Where did you grow up? Um, I grew up down in um, southern Tasmania um, at a place called Dodgers Ferry, which is Mm -hmm. about 40 minutes out of uh, Hobart, down in the southeast of uh, Tassie. And um, honestly, um, looking back, it was pretty it was an idyllic sort of um, upbringing. You don't appreciate this sort of thing at the time as a kid, <laughs> obviously. But um, we were near three beaches. We just played, uh, you know, um, around all these rocky headlands, going fishing and snorkeling and surfing and playing in swamps. And, of course, this was, you know, back in the day before mobile phones and parental overreach and <laughs> you disappeared off at first thing in the morning and as long as you were back home by 6 o'clock at night, um, it was all, good. all was well. So looking back, it was a, it was a really, really good uh, way to grow up. Yeah. And uh, so I was there literally until I was almost 18 and oh, wow. the usual thing we did uh, in the 90s uh, in Tasmania where, uh, you know, the, the economy wasn't that great. Back then, so a lot of us were looking to get to the mainland as soon as we finished year twelve, which I did, and went to uni for a bit up on uh, up in Coffs Harbour before spending oh, wow. some time working in Sydney and then in Melbourne, and eventually came back to Tassie, realising that the grass wasn't <laughs> greener on the other side and things were a bit better uh, economically speaking in Tassie, and um, huh. yeah, I've continued to work and live in Tassie ever since. I did not know that. That's very interesting. Did. Do you have siblings? Did, so you said you, you know, hang around and played. Yeah, yeah. I'm the I'm the eldest of three. I have a um a brother and a sister, younger brother mm-hmm. and younger sister. Mm-hmm. Um, sadly, my brother's not with us anymore. Oh, sorry um, to hear that. And uh, yeah, but um, so yeah, we all sort of went away for a bit, and then would mm-hmm. would come back to Tasty, yeah. and uh, so I spent another seven years down in the south basically in around Hobart working there for government and then for myself for a bit and um, then decided to move up to the the north of the state and have the been here sunny north since. as they say God's country um yeah no <laughs> it, so parochial us Australians I don't think it's just Tasmanians. absolutely oh, so parochial. Yeah. Crazy. oh it's the whole whole north south divide so uh yeah I'm definitely a uh a, uh, a Bogues drinker now, so I consider oh. myself a northern Tasmanian person. You can stay there. Uh, <laughs> I can stay. That's good. <laughs> I hate beer. <laughs> so when you were at school, did you do a lot of sport? Like I know you, you talked about the what, especially if people are listening and they're not in Australia, that kind of idyllic Australian um, childhood that most of us have actually reflected upon who are Australian on the podcast. Um, so apart from that running around on the beach and and exploring and all that kind of stuff, what other sort of sporty active things did you do as a kid? Look, it's funny um, because people sort of ask this a lot 
as a you know a runner. I came into running um mm. as a as an adult in sort of my mid 30s and um at the time I'd tell people no I never did anything at school or anything like this but um I was actually going through my mother had redone all our baby books and all that sort of stuff and Aww. all the things from school that mums <laughs> hang on to <laughs> and I was going through it and it actually reminded me of the fact that actually I was into sports when I was younger so when I was in primary school I, you know, did like the inter, um, inter school competitions for swimming and running. Um, and we used to do, um, not, we used to do this thing called the hash house harriers in the local community yeah. with my father and all his mates. So I was into that sort of around the ages of, you know, eight, nine, 10. And then as school got a bit more serious, I was very academically focused. We were an academic family, yeah. not a sort of a sporty family. Mm-hmm. So that all quickly fell by the wayside. Um, I played cricket for a few years, mm-hmm. but again, sort of by mid high school, um, you know, the studies were way more important. I think um, it was mm-hmm. a relief for my parents to not have to do Saturday morning um, cricket anymore. And uh, yeah, sort of didn't um, didn't do anything at school sort of from there on in sort of by, you know, my early teens. Yeah. Um, was still active, like again, you know, but it was just out of school. We'd yeah. get home and you'd go straight for a surf, or um, I got into scuba diving and and compressor diving mm-hmm. or hooker diving, as it's mm-hmm. referred to, with my father going after you know crayfish and abalone and that sort of thing. So always pretty active, and we were a camping type family, so we're always outdoors and, as mm-hmm. you say, running around. I practically lived on my bike. Yeah. Um, but um, in terms of like school sports or that sort of thing. Not so much. Yeah, kind of by the time I was about 14 or so, I, I didn't have time for that. I it was <laughs> head down into the books and, you know, worrying about college and university and all that sort of thing. So what did you study? Um, I actually studied educational multimedia um, right. at uni. <laughs> uh, so um, I right. got into, <laughs> yeah, okay, so... <laughs> So basically, uh, just to, for the benefit of everybody listening, um, so this is about the mid-1990s and mm. uh, everyone's excited by CD-ROM and graphics and video on computers and this new thing called the internet. That'll never catch on. Um, <laughs> so I was I was very much into computer anything and, um, yeah, started a, a degree up in um, Coffs Harbour called Educational Multimedia, which is basically, um, you know, electronic learning essentially. Mm. And did that for a semester, went chasing some work to fill in the two-month break and ended up getting an offer to a job in um, Sydney doing, doing um, graphic design and web development. Uh, okay, yep. And uh, I thought, well, this is actually what I want to do in three years' time, two and a half years' time. Let's just go for it now. Um, wow. And I did. And uh, it was probably the right thing to do because in a year's time, the people who were finishing the the course ahead of me, I was now employing them. So um, that was, that was a weird, a weird time, but it worked out well. And um, yeah, I I sort of worked in that space for about 15 years up until sort of about 2012, where I just got bored of it all and um, decided to go into metal fabrication and engineering and uh, (laughs) did an apprenticeship and something completely different. And uh, now I work as an electrical designer doing drafting and um, engineering consultancy. So. so there's some overlap, like the design element and that like understanding the tools of the design. Um, you're probably using CAD or some of those yeah, other, those yeah. kind of programs now. Yeah. So I suppose there is an element of that, like maybe your engineering designs look much nicer than they would have otherwise. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. No, it was interesting. Well, it was actually funny because I always planned on doing engineering leading up until literally about year 12 and then, you know, this whole computer multimedia mm. thing sort of took my uh, um, took my attention <laughs> and opened my creative mind, I suppose, for want of a better term. And I just went off in that path and sort of since then have slowly come back round to the, the engineering side of things. Mm. Um, either that or I just get bored easily and I need to do different things every so often. <laughs> How many careers would you say you've had? Oh, probably two or three yeah depending on yeah. how much of a difference you you I mean it, I've sort of been in construction and engineering since about 2012 but okay sort of the first four or five years of that yeah. was 
you know, working hands-on in the field with tools, et cetera. And, and now I'm back in an office, you know, swearing at a computer all day. <laughs> um, and there's been, like, I've done a lot of project management, both in IT and, yeah. and, and now in um, sort of, you know, construction and engineering. So there's an overlap there as well. Mm. It's all emails and just talking to people yeah. at the end and trying to line up resources with problems and that sort yeah. of stuff. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's better, you know. I don't think I ever envisaged myself as being someone who was going to do the, the one thing my entire life. Yeah. Um, and I think it seems to be a pretty common thread amongst other people I've known who have worked in the IT field. Mm-hmm. It's known for a bit of burnout and people decide they want to, you know, I got to do something else or I'm going to go completely insane. So Yeah. Yeah. You can just stare at that screen. <laughs> So pretty, much, pretty much, pretty <laughs> much. That's fascinating. I did not know a lot of that. I mean, I did know that the uh, some of the web stuff and some of that, but I wasn't. I didn't understand some of the engineering construction side of it. So that's really cool. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, even well, it, re retraining yourself into something that's you know it is quite different, as you said, from from the just purely design um, IT side. It's quite different, really. Yeah. Well, I've actually. I, I, you know, to sort of complete the full circle, I'll, I'm actually going back to uni this year to to start and actually get the the degree in engineering that I always planned on oh, wow. getting as a as a 15 year old or 16 year old. So um, that's going to be a slow process, obviously doing yeah. it full time, but uh, yeah. while working full time. Sorry, um, but uh, yeah, it's funny how things come back around yeah. if you give them, give them enough time. These circles, circles of life that we have. That's awesome. All right, now. Um, when you were in Sydney, did you, was it like you did, you said you didn't really start running until you're in like th- your thirties, I guess in, you're in Sydney in around like your twenties or that kind of. I was up there in my late teens actually. Oh, um, wow. so from sort of 18 through to, yeah, probably my, um, yeah, when I was actually 20. Okay. Um, no, my big thing for sort of between being a kid and, you know, to my thirties was actually mm-hmm. mountain biking. Um, and that actually started um, in earnest while I was in Sydney. Uh, I'd always used a bike, like always had a bike and always yeah. rode everywhere. Um, growing up out of a, an urban area, um, you know, there were few to any buses. R- Regional Tasmania is not is known for its say. awesome public transport. <laughs> so if you wanted to get somewhere and you couldn't get your parents to take you anywhere, you were on your bike, literally. Yeah. So I always rode and I always enjoyed it. And um, like I do things like go for a 10K bike ride with my dad, you know, in the morning, mm. just as a bit of a fitness thing from time to time. And I, I, I used it for my paper run growing up and all that. Of but when I started working in Sydney, um, I found a, a, a sort of a group of us who were all actually keen on mountain biking. Mm-hmm. And we had this wonderful resource called the Blue Mountains, mm-hmm. an hour's train ride to the West. Yeah. So um we all started sort of mountain biking of a weekend. And um, my, I think my, my first big sort of major purchase that I had to get a loan for was actually a, a, a $3,000 motorb- um, motorbike, $3,000 um, mountain bike, which doesn't sound like much these days, but back then it was, a, it was unfathomable to most people. And it was I don't think of- my car would have been worth that much back then. No, no. no well, my first <laughs> car probably wasn't either. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, we all had serious mountain bike serious for the time, late Mm. 90s. And literally every weekend without fail, we'd uh, go up the Katoomba line and stop off at all these various places along the way. And um, yeah, that was sort of my physical release for quite a few years. Sitting down a lot during the week, I assume. Yeah, well, yeah. sitting down, you know, um, clicking away at a computer all week mm. and uh, come Saturday, a nice sunny day, let's get on the train, um, get up in the mountains and ride all the way down. So, um, and that continued when I moved to Melbourne a few years later. And um, it's just always been something I do. Probably yeah. only have really sort of, it's taken a back seat maybe in the last two years, a, due to lack of time and also, also you know, concerns about getting injured, um, injured before races and that sort of thing. Um, had a couple of close calls, um, you know, coming off the bike a, a few weeks before a race and thinking, oh, that could have been silly. Nasty. You know, when you've got you know, all these race fees paid up for. It's such a scary sport. <laughs> I well, find. It is now. It's funny because um, 
uh, we were actually out on the West Coast um, just yesterday and looking at all the new mountain bike trails up around Mount Owen um, in the foothills around um, Gormanston, Mm -hmm. uh, just to the east of Queenstown. And those trails have a reputation for being quite gnarly, very Mm -hmm. rocky and steep and a bit, I've heard a few people say they're a bit scary. And um, yeah, what riders are doing these days, and obviously the bikes have become much, much better. Like, you know, as I said, I had a a dual suspension bike in 1999, which was quite a big thing those days, unless you're into serious competitive downhill mountain biking. Um, But it was absolutely primitive and useless compared to a standard dual suspension bike today like in terms of the capabilities and what the suspension can do and what you can get away with without completely prinkling yourself into Mm. a tree um so everyone's going a lot faster and you can see it in the the gear that people are having to wear you know full face um helmets and all the shin pads and elbow Mm. pads and neck protectors and that sort of stuff because they're going so much faster and jumping farther and um like it's it's fun and exciting, but I tell you what, when it goes wrong, it goes wrong badly as well. It's not so nice when it goes wrong. So, did you do any like competition with the mountain biking? No, no. It was yeah. just with. Um, look, honestly, the competition was just between about seven of us who yeah. all worked together. You know. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, we just rode together. No one. Mm. It was just friendly competition, mm. so you could get down. You know, the first yeah. or the. You know, it was more more just about having fun and. Um, honestly, the racing side of it never really, to be honest, I wasn't even really aware of it. Um, yeah, I'm sure it existed. The, yeah, it wouldn't but, have been uh, so much back then either, though, would there, compared to now, perhaps? Look, there was Or even a bit. is there now. There is a fair bit now, though. There, there's, a, there's probably a lot more now. Um, look, it, it, I suppose if someone had actually come up to me and said, hey, we're going to do this race, I probably would have given it some thought. But yeah. at the time it was... It was literally, you know, we're going to go up to, you know, this place on the weekend. We haven't been up there for a while. We'll go for a ride. You know, I've got to be back by five, back in Sydney. It's like, okay, Mm. we've got enough time. And that's what you did. And there was your bit of fun for half your weekend. Mm. Um, Racing and competition, until I got into running, it was just, it didn't sort of come into my mind at all. I didn't give it a second thought or even think it was something I would actually do. Yeah, that's fascinating. Like, because a lot of people are very driven by that, and you can see it through all of their sporting or their activity, not just through running, but you know they sign up to all kinds of sports, so uh, like competitions, not just the sport or the activity itself. Mind you, that you know the things like bushwalking and and hiking and and um, the mountain biking probably does lend itself more to just the activity. Like people, there's not, yeah, the the competition around it, it's not quite the same like people if you, no, you say to no, someone no. i'm a runner they go oh what are you racing in or what's your next race or they're always asking that kind of question i think i think running is a bit more like that where they're mm. um uh, i mean obviously you don't need to race in order to be a runner True. absolutely not but um a lot of people probably want to test their abilities or test their skill or test their progress mm. um and it's also a, 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 a communal way of doing it through running. I mean, it'd be no different through mountain biking um, or, well, then there's no mm. such thing as competitive bushwalking to my knowledge. Um, <laughs> it probably is. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's called Roganing. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. Well, there you go. so you see, I, yeah, I know, orienteering yeah. and that sort of thing, yeah, perhaps. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. I think it, it I suppose it just depends the people that you have around you when you come into mm. a, a sport or a pastime um, back then, yeah, sort of none of us were racers or did like those sort of endurance or adventure racing events or those sorts of things. Whereas when I came into running um, years later, um, I was soon meeting people and they raced. It's like, Oh, you're going to do this race this weekend. Oh, I didn't know that was, a thing that's an option okay yeah i'll do it because you know there's that whole fear of missing out and yes. um running is a particularly social thing mm-hmm. um so that's perhaps where that more uh competitive um aspect of it came out but um yeah certainly during my 20s with uh yeah with mountain biking and um like i did a bit of i actually got into dirt biking as well actual you know with a, a, a motorbike um Wow. And again, wasn't interested in the racing side of it. I did have friends who did mm-hmm. race, 
And I just looked at it and thought, no, that just looks like a good way to break your collarbone. <laughs> um, so again, I just, I just did it for fun. And um, so do you, yeah, it was, sorry. In the times uh, when you were doing a lot of that and it was you know, less structured, if you like, that's probably like another way that you could put it. Um, you did mention earlier that you were doing it, you were doing it for social reasons, but also to get away from that, the office and to have that kind of, were you thinking this is an exercise that I'm doing because it's good for me or I'm doing this because it's fun and actually that's kind of a byproduct, is it? It's good for you. Yeah. Um, look, there were definitely times um, like, you know, when say, you know, you, you'd organise to, you know, a bunch of you to actually go up into the mountains and it'd fall through for whatever reason. Yeah. Um and the feeling certainly was on many occasions, well, like, well, stuff that I'm going to go up anyway. And yeah. you just spend an, um, a day on your own going for a ride. And yeah. uh, it's like, this is great. You, you, you want to make the most of your weekend, you know. Mm-hmm. And also, I suppose, at the time, living in a tiny apartment in the middle of North Sydney and having this very dense cosmopolitan existence, which is someone who'd spent all their life thus mm-hmm. far growing up in Tasmania, it's sort of like, okay, I need to get out of here and explore and, you know, get some clean air um, into yeah. the lungs and, you know, go somewhere where it's actually green. And um, so there, I think there was, there was part of that. Um, I don't really know whether fitness actually played a part of it or mm. certainly not a conscious part. I, I, like I went to the gym and, you know, looked after myself back then. Um, and obviously the riding helped as well as a you know, good aerobic activity, but I think I mostly did it just because it was fun yeah. and it was nice to be out in the bush, out on yeah. all these um, trails. And yeah, that was a good enough reason to uh, yeah head, head, head out there every weekend, regardless of whether anybody else was coming along or not. Do, do you think it, I, like I've done a tiny bit of mountain bike riding and there's an amount of, of adrenaline that comes with, you know, going fast down something, I suppose, and trying not to fall off. It, did you? Do you think you kind of? I don't want to use the the word adrenaline junkie because that's, I don't mean it like that. But just that that was a thing that you enjoyed, and certainly oh. when you're in your twenties, it's like we're always looking for what this is the next fun, cool. When, when you get um, look, there were a few trails that we used to hit regularly. There was one, the only one that I can really remember, bearing in mind we're talking over twenty years ago now, was called the Oaks Trail. I don't know whether it's still known or still a thing these days. And you've got to remember back 20 years ago, these sort of, you know, spe- specifically made trails that we have everywhere now just didn't yeah. exist back then. Yeah. Um, but uh, I remember just over each progressive weekend and visit, you'd get better and better and you'd be able to, you know, do the full trail without sort of mucking up or having to dab your feet on the ground or, <laughs> you know, go around an obstacle or you, you, you'd know where the jump was and you could complete it safely. Mm-hmm. Um, and I certainly enjoy going mm-hmm. fast. Um, you know, I've owned fast cars and fast bikes like <laughs> like most young men um, and, uh, you know, riding your, your mountain bike through the bush at breakneck speed is, yeah. you know, when you, when you get it right, it's, it's, it's a great feeling. It's certainly, I suppose, addictive. It's something you do once and you're like, oh, I wouldn't mind a bit more of that. <laughs> so there would there'd be a part of that. Yeah. 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 Not necessarily something you're conscious of at the time, yeah. but it, it's, it's a motivation there. That exhilaration that you feel. At yeah. Times. Yeah. Hmm. So, Okay. You came back to Tassie, you'd work, you for some reason went back down to the south and now you're back in the, you moved to the sunny side, <laughs> to the north end. Um, where, did, where did the running start? Tell us about that. The running came about, um, oh, would have been about 34, 35, probably hadn't taken as good a care of myself for a few years as I should have. Um, my partner at the time, She'd been sick and had to really concentrate on her, her health. And um, I think it just sort of came about there that uh, I was like, okay, it's time to lose some weight and, mm. you know, ca- ca- start caring about your health again. Um, and I remember early on actually really, really uh, finding trail running quite appealing just as a concept probably because it was just different to road running. Mm. Um, you know, if there's, I, I tend to have this annoying 
personality trait where I just can't do what everybody else does. I got to do something a little bit different or do the, do the weirder, harder, stranger <laughs> um, option. Don't know why. It's never <laughs> served me well. But I remember actually finding trail running very appealing. Again, being out in the bush, um, I was living, I was caretaking a farm out at a place called Biralee, which mm -hmm. for people who aren't familiar with Tassie or who live in Tassie and just have no idea where Biralee is, it's um, west of Launceston in literally nowhere um and uh the property actually had a, a quite a steep gravel rocky hill or like a track up a hill and i just go out and i just do repeats up and down just yeah. learning how to run up a hill and um it it started from that and um i think um i got in my mind uh, I was going to do a first race I ever did was this 11, the 11 K um, Freysene trail run race that Endorphin put on mm -hmm. Chris and Imogen and 11 kilometers was just how on earth do you run that far? Bearing in mind that I hadn't actually run say any kind of meaningful distance since probably about year eight cross country. <laughs> um, so I had, got up to the point doing maybe like a, a couch to 5k type program yeah. to the point where I ran um, 5k's continuously over 33 minutes or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, okay, this might be possible. And I'd gotten in contact with an old school friend, my old school friend, I mean, someone who I was good friends with in year three. And we hadn't <laughs> heard or talked to each other <laughs> yeah, since we we're about eight years old. And she was a PT and she said, oh, I'll put together a, a, a program for you so you can just work up to that distance over the next 10 weeks. Brilliant. And it was funny. I did most of the training up at Greens Beach along the nice trail along yeah. there. And, um, uh, you know, every sort of second or third uh, week, you'd push out, you know, an extra kilometre. And doing that extra kilometre, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to do seven kilometres today. <laughs> and it felt like such an amazing achievement. It was. Um, it's, well, it's, <laughs> it was. It's that fear of the unknown, you know. I know I can run, you know, 5Ks, but can I run 7Ks, yeah. you know? And you, you sort of have that fear. But sure enough, I got through it all and um, did the race and loved it and signed up, do what you do, signed up for another race, which was the Ross Marathon half, um, yeah, the half marathon at Ross. And it was all going swimmingly well until about 14 kilometers. And then my, one of my knees, I can't remember which one, decided it didn't want to be a knee anymore. Oh, no. <laughs> and I, I managed to limp home or managed to run through a lot of pain home and thought, okay, that, I, I need some help. And had heard about this group called Jono's Running Group. Ah. Jono being... <laughs> Mr. John Claridge, who pretty much everybody knows within yeah. the Tasmanian running scene. <laughs> and that's how my association with Old Train and with John and Amy started. And through them, um, I learned about all these other races. I, I actually thought there was only a handful of races in Tassie each year. And then I very soon learned because everybody else was talking about you know all these other races it was literally something on every other weekend it's like wow and suddenly the whole world opens up and you've got all these things to train for and care about and wow um compete like in and, and that's where the lolly shop really <laughs> well that, that that that's where the slippery slope started um mm -hmm. and uh yeah so uh i'm just trying to think where it went from there but um yeah it i suppose sort of my, 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 I, I, you know, John and Amy sort of became coaches both mm -hmm. in an official and a, a non-official mm -hmm. capacity over the years as I, um, I was, I was very much set on doing distance. I was never mm -hmm. going to be a particularly fast runner. And I, um, while I wanted to do, I set myself goals and wanted to do certain things in certain times, usually just based on numbers that sounded rounded and good yeah. <laughs> um it was about you know i want to you know i want to get out to do something beyond a, a, um, a half marathon and then i'll you know doing the full marathon and then of course it goes to ultras and um yeah. <laughs> it was probably in around that time i found out about um the cradle ultra which mm -hmm. at the time was tassie's 
longest run. This yeah. is before Gone Nuts 101 mm-hmm. came into existence. And I thought, I would love to do that. Um, and, yeah, I'd sort of just done my first, um, you know, 11-kilometre competition, <laughs> fun run, and I uh, thought, yeah, in two years or whatever it was, I, I, I want to do this 82-kilometre ultra and sort awesome. of set that as my, my, my very, very hedonistic and ambitious goal, <laughs> but actually managed to make it happen, which is not easy because you've got to uh, um, qualify, qualify in all sorts mm. per cradle. Mm. But yeah, from there, it was sort of these particular stepping stones doing the full um, 29K Freycinet um, run and um, a half marathon. And then, um, yeah, going up, uh, doing the Bruni Island Ultra. Mm-hmm. So a 64K road race and then eventually heading up to Cradle and a lot of races in between. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's crazy. That's where the teeth <laughs> dug in and have never let go, really. And you became a little bit, well, how long ago was that that you did that first 11K down at Fresno? It was either 2015 or 2016. I'm really okay. struggling to remember. Mm-hmm. Um, it would have been, I think, about 2016. You have put a lot in in that time. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's it's sort of been a blur. You, you kind of forget that it's only been the last I know, you know, sort of that thinking, much in your life. Because I can remember thinking, I don't know, it was probably mm, oh, it might have been early two thousands or mid two thousands. I was thinking, oh, I'd really like to do the uh, the cradle mountain run. And then I I back in those days, you to qualify, you just had to do a marathon in under four hours. So I did that and I went, yes, I could do it now. And then I don't know, I can't remember what happened, but I didn't, I don't think I even entered in the end. But and so, and then when I did think to enter it later, they changed the qualifications, of course. So, but although I think um the 50k at Greens Beach would have been a qualifier as well. Oh, okay. Because that's a trail run and it's over, it's an ultra, even though it's barely an ultra. So it's it's, it's one of those, I mean, they they kind of had two sets of rules, one set of rules for mainland who had access to actual, you know, 80 to 100K ultras like yeah. UTA and yeah. um, uh, the six-foot track and um, those sorts of um, events and then particular combinations for the, the Tassie locals yeah. who couldn't necessarily travel to the mainland to do those sorts of um, races. So I think back then and now um, it's still that if you do um, the Bruni Island Ultra yeah. and – do uh triple tops in under four hours yeah in the year it's it's annoying because you've got to enter in after those two events yeah so you've got to do um got to do those events and then the following year you can enter in for the year after (laughs) yeah so that's that's what messed me up (laughs) um trying to get into cradle i think it may have taken me three years rather than sort of (laughs) two years in order to actually get everything lined up. But um, no, it was awesome. And um, uh, I've completed my third cradle um, earlier this month and um, it still stands head and shoulders above any other event I've done. It's just so much fun and such a beautiful place to run, even though it hurts like crazy, as you'd expect. um, It's it's a very beautiful place to suffer pain. (laughs) If you have to, there's some there's some down here. It's not all up here. <laughs> well, actually, actually, it, uh, the actual race itself trends More down. mostly downhill, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, compared to say something like UTA 100, which I did a couple of years ago, um, that has way more elevation gain for you know literally you know 20 kilometers more distance. Um, but uh, it's a funny event because it's just not as inspiring um mm. you go you go around some nice areas but there's a lot of time spent running on roads on fire mm. trails going up and down all the steel ladders and staircases up around yeah. katoomba um and honestly i'll take washed out myrtle rooted i was gonna say with packs. those roots everywhere <laughs> yeah oh no no the the Duquesne valley is a far nicer place to be um, wow. even if you your legs aren't working aren't listening to your, your your brain and you're sort of stumbling around <laughs> so that does i mean obviously we'll talk a little bit more about the running now uh, in a minute but 
I do know that you're a very passionate bushwalker as well. Um, has that always been the case? Um, it, it's it's been a thing for longer than running. Yeah. Uh, I I enjoyed bushwalking as a kid. Um, that's the sort of multi-day hiking was something we never did as a family. We were mm. a, a car camping family. Yeah. Or, you know, with a caravan or going mm. to a, a, you know, a friend's shack on the East Coast or, you know, eventually our family got our own shack on the East Coast. And um, so that sort of outdoor existence has been part of me since, you know, I was very young. Um, I got into bushwalking mostly through fly fishing, actually, oh. um, probably <laughs> you know, 15 years ago. Um and uh, yeah, the the idea back then was obviously to access all these wonderful lakes yeah. in central Tasmania. Um, whereas now I'm mostly focused on climbing up mountains, mm-hmm. and ironically, that's actually come through the influence of trail running. Where um, you know, instead of going for a, a, you know a long run out on the road or, you know, doing laps around Travel and it's like, oh, let's go for a long run up Mount Holsa or, um, you know, Black Bluff Range or, you know, pretty much any trail that, you know, has a, has a semi-reasonable, somewhat runnable track. Um, so I started doing that once I got a bit more um, confidence in my, my trail running and, so, mm-hmm. you know, confidence in being able to do, you know, 20 kilometres or 30 kilometres in a day. Mm-hmm. And... Um, yeah, it's just sort of gone from there. Um, I discovered through a friend um, this thing called the Ables, which is uh, uh, basically a list of Tasmania's 158 tallest mountain peaks. Mm-hmm. And uh, I sort of, and uh, she was completing, well, going to do as many as she could as sort of a, uh, um, she had sort of survived a, a serious cancer scare. And, mm-hmm. you know, as part of her, you know, new lease on life was, Got to climb as many of these mountains as possible. And it's like, oh, that sounds like a that sounds like a pretty cool idea. I wonder if I could run a few of them. That'd be fun. And um, started doing that, and um, soon met Tracy, my partner, and she was into the same thing. Um, not running so much, but um, um, bush. She just got into bushwalking herself, and was um, you know focusing on the Ables as well. And of course. Uh, uh, when two people have the exact same idea of what would be a good way to spend a weekend together, um, it sort of snowballs from there. And um, yeah, it's, it, I was going to say, it's probably shared passion, shared obsession, uh, yep. a pretty fine line. Um, and yeah, that's what we've been doing for, for the last few years. And uh, yeah, yesterday uh, I completed my 120th out of the 158. Wow. So we're getting through them. So have you both done the same amount now? Almost. Trace is about three behind me at the moment. Um, there's been a few that um, we haven't done together, mm-hmm. um, but we generally try to stay in mm. sync as much as we can. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just it's just a great way to get out and see the state. Um, sometimes I do them running, sometimes um, um, bushwalking. Um, it's getting to the point now where the ones that are remaining to be done um, – don't lend themselves to a nice convenient day run. You sort of have to put a big pack on your back and head bush for several days in order to reach them. Um, But it's just a, it's just a great way to get outdoors and um, just enjoy this really, really wonderful state. We're very, very blessed to have. Um, It's amazing how much diversity of landscape Mm. we have in Tasmania compared to certainly other places in the world. And um, you, it never sort of ceases to amaze me. Uh, yesterday we were up on Mount Dukes, which is um, south of Queenstown, mm-hmm. and just the rock formations and geology of the area is quite unique, um, as, a, <laughs> as is pretty typical of the <laughs> West Coast. But uh, from where we were standing, we could see over to, um, you know, Frenchman's Cap and that group of yeah. mountains, which have very, also have a very distinctive um, geology as well. And then looking over to the northeast, we could see pretty much every mountain through the Duquesne and Pelion Ranges. So that's where the overland track yeah. is and yeah. Cradle Mountain and, and, and those mountains. And it was a beautiful day and we were just sitting on top of this helipad that's uh, next to the summit can enjoying uh, lunch and <laughs> I was like, how good is this? 
Wow. This is, it's just it's just so much fun. So um, ironically, the bushwalking is actually getting in the way of a lot of the um, I was running, gonna... running, 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 running competitions now. I still <laughs> run a lot um just for training and to yeah. to stay fit but uh, um competing in races has definitely taken a back seat over the last couple of years obviously covid um yeah. sort of uh started that but um i'd actually been it was funny i um during 2018 that was probably my big build up to where i was just racing in everything mm-hmm. um i'd come out of a long-term relationship had a lot of time yeah. uh just to indulge in in training mm-hmm. and was pretty much racing everything and had decided to do uta 100 in may of 2019 with some friends who later pulled out um so everything was this great big build up to this big big, big event. Like uta 100 mm-hmm. is sort of the marquee trail running event in australia that you know to use a, you know, sort of sorts out the men from the boys, if you want to use a crude euphemism. <laughs> um, that's the one that the serious runners sort of, you know, Mate. peg their hat on. Yeah. And um, so everything was going really, really well for that. Um, just just racing practically every weekend, recovery during the week, getting faster, PBs, feeling really, really confident. Um, and then I got injured um, eight weeks out from the no. from the race and obviously freaked out i um some some of the listeners might be aware of a, a wonderful gentleman by the name of chris dalton who mm-hmm. um is the head of soulmates down yep. in hobart um he was organizing a wonderful charity run where he ran from launceston to hobart mm-hmm. to raise money and uh wanted some people to sort of help him through the the graveyard shift as he ran from ross yeah. I think it was Baghdad in the middle of the night down the Midlands Highway. Um, I'm an idiot, so I said yes. And uh, so I ended up doing about 70 kilometres in the middle of the night down a, a highway through all these roadworks and managed to tear something in uh, my right calf, um, just all the stops starting between yeah. running and walking. He's, he's got this amazing ability to r- run slowly and walk really, really fast as one smooth movement. <laughs> which I can't do. And certainly my right calf decided it really couldn't do. So um, I went to Mr. Um, Dr. Vu, who did his magical voodoo on my leg and got me back running in time for UTA. Yeah. But it sort of messed up my prep. And between that and not enjoying the terrain and the actual race Mm -hmm. as much as I sort of like expectations were pretty high for, for this event. And don't get me wrong. It's a really, really well, run event yeah, very but you- um but um just the actual course itself i'd done i'd done cradle twice by that stage and that was what i was comparing it to and it was pretty unfair uh, <laughs> because even though cradles are very low key very sort of casual or run as a very sort of casual insider type event mm. um the the actual course is second to none. It's just absolutely mm. beautiful. And um, yeah, got onto UTA and expected a hundred kilometers of the same and, and didn't really get it. That and the sort of the messed up final preparation meant that I was a, a fair bit slower than I, I kind of mm. hoped and thought I could do. Um, I just, it actually killed my love of competing for, yeah. for quite a while. I tried yeah. to do six, six weeks later, um, it was the Freysnay 29, which is a, a, another absolute favourite event that I mm. rarely miss. And it was possibly down to just not having recovered enough in time, but I mm. completely fell apart and was an hour slower than normal. And oh. I didn't I didn't race for, I don't know, four or five months mm. after that. And, um, yeah, ended up doing a finally sort of coaxed myself back into to kind of having that motivation again, having the spark. Yeah. Um, come about February of 2020, um, did a, a 50K um, event called the Tarawira Ultra over in New Zealand, um, which was all right. That went okay. But then COVID hit and all the events were cancelled. And yep. sort of by that stage, it was sort of like, oh, we'll just go bushwalking instead. <laughs> and we'll take on this great big challenge, which what are you going to do when you've grabbed all of those, what is it, uh, bagged all those peaks? Uh, uh, there's still plenty more. <laughs> um, 
there's, there's um, uh, the the Abel's list doesn't include every single worthwhile mountain to climb okay. in the state. There's a lot that are either just under. Um, that's sort of the minimum eleven hundred meter high mm-hmm. um, height number. That sort of that sort mm-hmm. of you know typifies what's actually considered the highest peak, <laughs> um, and and quite a few more that. Um, uh, a part of a, a, a like a broader range. So, for those who are unfamiliar with the Abel's, yeah, an Abel is a peak in Tasmania over 1,100 meters high, mm-hmm. and also has at least 150 meters of vertical prominence or separation um, from a neighbouring peak. Okay. So, what that means is most of our mountains tend to be in sort of weird, sort of bumpy ranges and ridges, mm-hmm. rather than sort of individual neat little mm-hmm. conical mountains. Um, so, you know, a high broad peak um, will, will be the able when there'll be a neighbouring mountain, which is probably a lot more interesting, but just slightly lower than it. Yeah. Um, that's, that's not an able. So like a good example would be Mount Gerion, which is one of Tassie's famous, very, very jagged um, mountains in the Duquesne range, but it is a little bit lower and by all of about six or seven metres, oh. <laughs> um, than the Duquesne Range High Point, which is a big, broad, flat um, and relatively uninteresting um, <laughs> peak. And so if you want the Able, that's where you go. Um, so there's plenty of other places to, um, to, to visit once, once it's all done. I also enjoy just going out in winter generally um, in the snow, um, either mm-hmm. snowshoeing or I've started getting into a little bit of um, cross-country skiing. Mm. and um, we've actually started talking about um, doing a bit more pack rafting and, and that sort of thing. There's, there's, there's tons of other things to do. So I don't think the bushwalking days will be over as soon as the, the ables are, are, are done. It'll be just sort of like, okay, where else do we go now? There's, there's well, still a lot of the state you, um, to check out. You probably need to talk to some race organisers and tell them not to have races on the weekends. Like it's, if you could just race after work once or once or twice a month or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. T- t- Tuesday at five thirty is a good That's time for a race right. because, <laughs> because the weekends are a bit busy. <laughs> Well, that, that's actually the that's actually the issue that uh, yeah. a lot of the time it's sort of like, well, you know, this race is on of a Sunday. It's like, well, no, we need to go Friday night and mm. drive down for four hours to the other end of the state and sleep in the car so we can get up at six a.m. in the morning and go up this mountain instead. And yeah. um, you know, there's only so much time in the in the week. That's it's this work. Work gets in the way. Yeah. So, how? I mean, that's a question I ask lots of people, especially busy people, and you have a busy life and lots of busy hobbies as well that are time consuming. How do you, how do you fit it in? How do you prioritize it all? Um, Probably poorly uh, (laughs) at the moment. Um, I, I basically try to, um, I mean, I, I, I don't commute in a car, like I run to work and Mm -hmm. um, back, which sort of helps to get in a few Ks each yeah. day um, and sort of mix it in there. So uh, one of the great things about Launceston is that there are so many running groups that pretty much any day of the week, yeah. um, you can find some other people to run with who can sort of keep you honest. Yeah. So I usually do a, a you know, two or three run groups during the week. Okay. Um, when I'm in training or we'll, if I'm training for something specific, I'll, you know, I'll go out to, you know, places like Trevallon or the Gorge. Mm-hmm. Um, which we're extremely fortunate to have here in we Tasmania. Sure certainly were during lockdown um, mm-hmm. and, and Heritage Forest as well. Um, and I think it just comes down to, to, to priority, um, just, just prioritising, you know, w- what do you want more? Mm. Um, I'll be honest, it's sometimes very, very difficult to drag yourself up at five o'clock in the morning yeah. and go for a two-hour long run before work. Um <laughs> But I find I actually find signing up for events is a really really strong motivator. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm probably a bit more disciplined when I do sort of have that hanging over my head. It's like you paid three hundred dollars for this event, <laughs> better go out and train for it, and uh, you know not make a fool of yourself because you didn't do enough training. Uh-huh. Um, and and certainly when you 
when you are looking at sort of more like, you know, the ultra marathon type distances, um, you kind of can't fake it mm. as I unfortunately discovered at the last uh, cradle where I really hadn't done quite enough and um, was a little bit slower than I, I hoped and, and struggled through parts of it. Um, you've really got to do your homework. Whereas, yeah. um, you know, s- certainly shorter distances, um, unless you're aiming for a really, really particular time, um, you can just sort of go out and go out and have fun. They're a bit more forgiving. Perhaps. Well, I, I think I think the difference, you know, if you're if you do a 10k and and you know you you you're right on your PB versus you can probably back it off 15% be a be a few minutes slower or mm. you know five minutes slower um, and still really enjoy yourself. Um, if you don't have your fitness for an 80k event and uh, everything starts falling apart at about Good. the 46k <laughs> mark and you've still got a long way to go, um, that does sort of wake you up and make yeah. you worry a bit. But yeah. then you get, then you get your second wind and and I don't know, you just just learn to deal with the pain. It was actually really, really it was really funny. Um, Trace found a, a thing in the examiner yesterday. One of the guys who he actually finished just behind me. Um, gentleman by the name of Chris Price. He actually ran. I with booked a him in. He's he's speaking to us next week. Oh, awesome. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, no, it's like it was like, oh, you know, it's really starting to hurt a bit. And yeah, found out two weeks later he broken his bloody leg. And I don't oh know how. Gosh. And I and I it was sort of like uh, Trace goes, oh, do you know him? And it's like, oh the name's familiar. And I went through the results. I was like, oh, what's the bet? He actually was faster than me with a broken leg. And <laughs> it was only about five minutes slower, I think. Oh, wow. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I thought that was just awesomely hilarious. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to him, not just about that, but, yeah, that in itself is like, what? <laughs> well, it's actually true. It's very much true what he was um, talking about in the article because you expect a certain amount of pain. Mm-hmm. Like if it's mm-hmm. not hurting for, for those longer distance events, mm-hmm. um, you know, you're obviously not trying hard enough, but it does hurt after a while. <laughs> yeah. And um, I suppose people who are enjoy it and um, are competitive with it um, are the ones who learn how to manage mm. or deal with the pain better. Yeah. yeah. Um, otherwise, you'd just pull the pin and say, no. Well, enough. Where's something. my comfort zone? I want to go back there. <laughs> um, and I suppose that's probably a risk because there's a difference between, oh, my legs are feeling very tired versus, uh, you know, I've got two ends of broken mm. bone bashing into each other, but, you know, I can still manage it. So that it's, is it's, something it's a bit scary. We talk about that a little bit here that one of the things I love about running and I, I tell my mum who always says, oh, you run too much, you know, over different times periods of life um people who don't run will often say things like that to you but i i go but i feel like i can i know my body better because i run because i'm using it all the time i'm not just sitting around behind the computer i feel like i know it better but at the same time i still haven't been able to perfect that pain that i'm feeling today when i run is that a pain that i should be worried about or is that a pain that is going to go shortly anyway. You know, we all get those little kind of niggles when we first start off or whatever, and then they just disappear. And maybe that is the the hint to our body that if it if it goes after three or four k, then it's probably just something that's. It's usually go. about seven k's for me. I, like the, the, the first the first 20, 30 minutes is horrible. It's sort of like, why am I doing this? This is a bad idea. And then you know, eventually your body warms up, and it's like, okay, this is nice. That's why I I, I do this. Um, that constant yeah. pain that you were talking about for the ultras oh. is a, if the different kettle of fish again, really, isn't it? Well, you don't, it, it, it's weird. Like um, with an event like Cradle, and I use that as an example just because I've, I've sort of done it a few times now, mm. um, you know, the first five, six Ks, you know, it's all very scary and intimidating and you become hypersensitive to absolutely everything because you realise that you're committing yourself to a full day of whatever's about to happen. Mm. Um, and then once you sort of get up over cradle itself and you, you know, get on a, it's, it's mostly downhill on cradle um, circ down into waterfall Valley. It feels great. Yeah. And you're like, Oh yeah, this is awesome. And you, you were inspired by the environment around you and you've got barn bluff and everything's awesome. And that sort of continues usually down into frog flats and then you're mm-hmm. starting to feel a bit tired and the climb back up to New Pelion. 
And it's generally once you gone past Kiora and you're in the, the Duquesne Valley where it's all very heavily eroded. Um, mm. It's open myrtle forest. It's quite beautiful. Um, and it's in the shade as well, which is good because usually by this stage, it's sort of starting to get the warmer part of the day. Um, but the track is very, very eroded and you've got all these tree roots yeah. everywhere. And, you know, you've got to watch your feet. Well, well, it's it's the point where your legs aren't necessarily paying as much attention as they're supposed to be and, and listening to your brain. It's like, come on, keep your knees up, you know, watch where you're going and your legs are starting to drag a bit and it's very easy to, to come unstuck. Yeah. Um, and that's where um, you really start to notice the nickels in your knees mm. and just the, the general fatigue starting to, to, to creep in. Mm. Um, and then you just hang on for dear life from there on. <laughs> until you get to Lake St. Clair. Got to get home now, I'm here. So uh, what you said earlier was interesting in, in that you're motivated to get up and get out the door on um, because of events that you signed up for, especially for your running training. What's motivating you for the um, bushwalking? Is it the moment, is it the ticking off the ables or is it a, a different thing that's just a byproduct? I, I just enjoy it. It's just a good way to spend spare time. Mm-hmm. Um, the like the Ables is. I mean, uh, people will occasionally sort of sneer at the idea of just ticking off a list and and just doing something mm-hmm. to tick off items on a list is yeah pretty shallow. I admit um, that really just exists as a motivator. It's mm-hmm. more um, okay. The weekend's here. What are we doing? Where are mm-hmm. we going? Let's do yeah. something. I don't want to just sit at home and, and, and waste my weekend. Um, Even those words that you're using, if you think about it, like you feel that it's a waste if you, unless you're out there yeah. doing something, exploring, looking, you know, whatever it is, a race or an event or a bushwalk or something, which I think is interesting in itself. I, I'm pretty, I suppose I'm, I'm pretty precious about my time. Very driven. Um, like I, I, I like to, I just like to utilize it on mm-hmm. things that are worthwhile. Mm-hmm. Um, like I don't watch TV or anything mm-hmm. like that really. Um, uh, and I, I won't, you know, like I, I want to be out doing something. I, I don't want to get to, you know, Sunday afternoon at five o'clock and think, mm-hmm. oh God, I've not done anything with the weekend. Because yeah. now I'm going to go to work and, you know, I'm going to spend, you know, 40 hours in front of a computer and, and on the phone yeah. um, for the week. Um, and I just, honestly, I just enjoy being being out in the bush. I yeah. enjoy being up mountains. Um, yeah. There's something, I don't know, the air's fresher up there. It's thinner up mm-hmm. there, I guess, maybe. <laughs> <And> that's <laughs> not really that high. Um, but I tell myself things like, oh, you know, life's better at a thousand meters out um, elevation. <laughs> and it's true. You're, you're just walking sort of above, you know, you can see more. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're extraordinarily fortunate. We have an absolutely beautiful state that we can access, like we can freely wander a vast amount of it. Mm. Um, you know, there's not many places in the world where we have access to so much um, uh, wilderness that, you know, access isn't restricted. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's something Australians take for granted is, is you know, national parks and the commons. Mm. Um, and it's not been until later in life where I've talked to people who have come from the UK or certain parts of Europe where a lot of these places are locked up and it's only for the rich or for people who know the right people and all that. Um, whereas in Tassie, we have this, you know, literally, oh, what is it about 45% of the state it's covered that in we, it's just covered in this amazing wilderness that you will just not find anywhere else in the world. And it's, you're allowed to go there. All you've got to do is, you know, be prepared to put in the effort. Um, and, uh, that's, I think that's, that's pretty much enough motivation in of itself. Mm. Um, look, I like the idea of like with the Ables or with any sort of peak bagging list or, you know, whether it's waterfalls or anything like that, it's a motivator to, rather than just going to the same places all the time, it motivates you to go somewhere different and see a little bit more of the state. Um, as a, as a kid, we, our family, we didn't, um, like go on overseas trips or even to the mainland or anything like that. We just Mm -hmm. went camping. 
which again, at the time I didn't appreciate. I just thought we were, you know, didn't have enough money. And, you know, because all my friends were going to Disneyland. I was like, oh, why are we going camping? <laughs> um, but the great thing was by the time I was an adult, I'd actually seen quite a bit more of the state than a lot of my peers. Yeah. And this is, I almost feel like this is a continuation of, of that where there's all these amazing places in the state that most people don't go. Mm. They might've heard about them. A lot of times they haven't. Um, and just bit by bit, I'm getting to see almost all of the state. Um, and that's, I don't know, it's one of the sort of strange ironies, of obviously, in the last two years where people haven't been able to travel. Yeah. I, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, I miss going overseas and oh, I can't, <laughs> can't wait to go over to Melbourne. And I'm sort of looking at them going, what? we live in the most amazing place. <laughs> like I, I could quite happily be quarantined in Tassie for the next 10 years when I've literally walked looked at, climbed up over every square inch of Tassie, then I'll look further afield. Um, yeah, we're, we're just extraordinarily fortunate in this state to, to have what we have here. Mm -hmm. And that's enough of a reason to, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and it's sort of more exciting than being in Launceston on a Saturday <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> Which may not be squished in as the centre of Sydney, but still. <laughs> no, no, it's still a bit more urban than, you know, being out having an entire mountain range to yourself exactly. somewhere in the southwest. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Um, so would you call yourself an adventurer or runner? Uh, or a probably runner? not. <laughs> or I don't know. Probably, <laughs> I don't know. I'd probably, I suppose, with a heavy sense of tongue-in-cheek, I'd call myself a, a, a mountain guy. Yeah. I like mountains. I like running up mountains. I like walking up mountains. I spend a lot of time thinking about mountains, <laughs> maybe, maybe more so than thinking of myself as a runner. That's um, interesting. I don't know. I suppose a lot of my friends are runners. So to yeah. be a runner in amongst a, a large group of runners and multiple friendship circles of runners is hardly mm. something that stands out. Um, for the few people who I know who aren't runners, they probably think, oh, Ben's a crazy guy who's, who runs. Yeah. Um, no, I, adventurer probably sounds a little pretentious. I don't know. <laughs> No, that's probably for other people to judge, but no, I, I sort of, uh, I'm just a like, uh, just a person who likes climbing up mountains, and exploring, exploring, mm. yeah, and and just being being active, I guess. So, how long do you want to be that active person? How do you picture that in your head in the future? Uh, as as long as possible until they throw me in the ground. Um, it's it's interesting because through some of the um, walking groups we're involved in. Uh, you meet these wonderful people who are in their 70s who mm -hmm. are still walking and you just see the benefits of a lifetime of fitness yeah. and being active. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, maybe they're not as fast as they were 30 years ago, but they're still out there. Um, we did the, the Western Arthurs last year. Um, there was a guy there um, in his early 70s. And uh, I tell you what, he complained less than the rest of us, <laughs> he, he just got on with it. Yep. And that's that's really appealing. That's where mm. that lifetime of fitness really shows. You know, you see people who are, you know, obviously haven't looked after themselves or mm -hmm. have had issues crop up and they've slowed down um, as they've hit their 50s and 60s. And by the time they're in their 70s, they're, you know, the health issues are really starting to impact on their daily quality of life, ability to be able to move around. Mm -hmm. And you see these other guys who are able to shove a 20 kilo pack on their back and, you know, go over a mountain range over multiple days. Um, that's where the, um, yeah, there's a lot of appeal there to, yeah. to, to, to be like that. And I suppose if you think of, well, where's the motivation to get up and actually run to work rather than, you know, drive in, it's like, well, no, you, you gotta, gotta lay the foundations now. You can't get too lazy while you've still got the, you know, while you're in your 30s and 40s. Yeah, it's much easier Otherwise, to do it then. Well, it's much easier to do it now and, mm. you know, work around injuries and, and maintain that strength um, mm. so that, uh, yeah, when you're in your 60s and 70s, you can actually enjoy your old age because mm. I've, I've known, unfortunately, quite a few people um, who have hit retirement mm -hmm. and they just can't probably do what they envisaged 
that they were going to be doing. Mm. Um, they they don't have the mobility. Um, I mean, I look at my my own parents, um, my, my mother especially. Um, she's only in her mid sixties, and um, mm-hmm. it's actually her birthday today. Happy happy oh. birthday, mum. <laughs> um, you know, the the knees aren't quite what they used to be, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, like uh, you know, she's still got lots of life to live. Yeah. I hope. And I um, hope so. She's not that much older than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know. She's not about to go on a five-day hike over yeah. mountains, yeah. Um, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to, got to, got to put in the work. And mm. I think that's the difference. You can, you can see um, those people who have just had that lifetime of regular activity. Not necessarily, you know, they've been, you know. Um, you know, racing competitively for decades or they've played footy into their late forties or, um, uh, you know, it seems to be a growing band of, uh, people who do, um, triathlons in their fifties because they, you know, they start to semi-retire and they've got the time to fit in all the training. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you just gotta, gotta keep active, um, Mm. so that, uh, you can enjoy your, enjoy your retirement. It's actually like for the science even shows now, I'm sure you are aware of that. It's not even just our physical health. It's actually our mental health as well. So as you get older, um, if we don't stay physically, you know, healthy, then our minds don't either. So what's going on in our minds and our moods and all of that is all affected by how healthy we are physically. So, you know, it's not just, just our physical self, but also the mental side of it which is such an important I mean it's something everyone talks about now as well yeah you know and it would be and it wouldn't be just the sort of the chemical response of Mm. being active that basically keeps our brain happy Mm. but also I think probably the sense of purpose you know whether it's that social Mm -hmm. aspect of just getting out with some friends and and you know going for a uh, a social run or run walk Mm -hmm. uh in Mm -hmm. the morning or um that sort of thing um versus being stuck at home and and probably losing those connection mm. with connections with friends um i would imagine that would that would play on play on your mind mm. and, and have a negative effect on mm. mental health as well um it's been interesting talking about mental health the number of people who i've come to know through running over mm. the years who mental health has been a real issue and running has mm-hmm. been that sort of one connecting thing that sort of once I say save them, that sounds a little over dramatic, but um, it's that one thing that actually helps them to, to work through those issues. Yeah. Um, and I reckon it'd probably be the, not only the combination of, you know, the good chemical responses mm-hmm. that we get from running um, in our brains, but also that sense of purpose and, and, and sense of mm. community running with other people, whether you do it socially or, you know, sort of having the tribe together at each, yeah. at, at the events, whether it's, you know, running clubs each weekend or park run or um, that sort of thing. One of, one of the funny things that sort of makes me laugh, when I first started running and, and, and doing it competitively, I never would have realised what a team experience running was you yeah. know you think you think of running and you think it's an individualistic it's true sport, yeah. unless yeah. you're doing team relays yeah um but it, you know it's one person against every other person mm-hmm. and the first person over the line wins <laughs> yet you get into I don't, I don't know maybe it's just our local scene or you know the fact that everyone just enjoys themselves and no one you know takes it too seriously yeah um you know, everyone celebrates everyone's achievements, whether or not they actually won the race or whether, you know, someone, you know, managed to shave a minute off their, yeah. their time, you know, towards the, the tail end of the pack. Everything's, a, uh, you know, it's a small victory for, for that yeah. person. Everyone's there to support everyone else. And um, it's just a great community. And that's something that, I've certainly noticed as my sort of over the last say seven years as um, kind of running certainly took over my life. And <laughs> most of my friends were runners and were part of this community. Yes. Um, is that it's just this great big shared experience, even though technically it's an individual, individual, yeah. uh, individualistic pursuit. So it's interesting. Yeah. Like I even, I remember when I first started at the running club in my twenties 
I would look around and, and just be full of the endorphins when you cross the line. It's like, oh, just did that. You look around and, and everybody's chatting because we're all full of that. But everyone, I remember thinking, you know, everyone has had a different experience. We all just did the same thing. So that, that in itself ties us together. But at the same time, it was all, we all had a different experience of it. And most of what that chat is about at the end of those races was what it was like for us. <laughs> you know, oh, I did this or I did that or this felt that way or whatever, um, which is it's just fascinating that there's, you know, 20 people in a race and there's 20 different versions of that race right there. In front it's, of it's funny how quickly you become friends through that shared experience, mm-hmm. though. Mm-hmm. Um, especially you know obviously a lot of my experience has been in longer events where people cross the line and we're all yeah. just days apart hap- <laughs> we're all we're, no, we're all happily messed up like you know no one can walk properly everyone's just exhausted <laughs> exhilarated and like you meet people like I've, i had some great friendships that have literally been forged across multiple races while we've been running together you know wow. people who sort of run at about the same yeah. pace at the same time and you know, it's like, oh, hey, I remember you from three weeks ago. Oh, how's it going? Oh, did the ankle sort itself out? Oh, you know, how'd yeah. you go after that fall? Blah, 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 blah. And, um, yeah, like you get to know people so well because, you know, you see people almost at their worst or their most mm. exposed, mm-hmm. um, sometimes at their most desperate. Mm-hmm. Um, and you bond pretty quickly over that. And then afterwards you realise, like, I don't even know what they do for a living. Yep. <laughs> um, you don't talk about anything else. You talk about, you know, nutrition, uh, training, shoes, you know, Weather. whether they, the, you know, what the, what they, you know, whether they like their new vest, etc. Yeah. Other stuff just doesn't factor into it, and you forge these wonderful, really, really deep, but very one-dimensional <laughs> friendships <laughs> with these people who, you know, and then you, you cross the finish line and you just sit there dazed and confused, and laughing and just <laughs> eating without any shame whatsoever um <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a sort of a no wonder people who don't run call it crazy i think pat farmer i've already said this a few times on the podcast when i interviewed him a few a couple of months ago he talked about liking the fact that ultra running um pulls you apart and then puts you back together basically at the that's how he described ultra running yeah. to, for himself. And it was that, you know, literally getting to know yourself again and perhaps you're getting to know a few people around you as well. Yeah. I remember reading somewhere that, um, and it's something that stuck with me again, in regards to sort of ultra running and endurance sports and, mm-hmm. and, you know, long distance triathlons and those sorts of adventure races that to, to figure out just how strong or to realize how strong you are, you first got to attempt to break yourself. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I suppose, you know, the, I remember, you know, going back a few years where I was, you know, really focused on just pushing out the distance each time. It's yeah. like, at what point am I going to break? Yeah. Um, because early on when you start running um, and you take it a bit seriously, you you tend to quickly injure yourself because yeah. you, you're having to do that initial strengthening. Um, and I remember, you know, through my first few races, you know, I had like a, you know, Achilles tendonitis and you deal with that. And then I had, um, you know, various other fairly minor, very typical ailments until Mm -hmm. you kind of get that strength work done and that, you know, that base, um, set in. Um, and then you just keep on pushing out. It's Mm -hmm. like, at what point am I going to really fall apart? (laughs) And it, and it doesn't quite happen. Like I've had some times where i've been completely wrecked um probably even even worse than uta um a few years ago um john o and amy and a, a bunch of us we had this idea of let's run frenchman's cap in a day for new year's day i think because i remember I, that, that i think it was 2017 <laughs> and i thought that's a great idea um the only problem was you know, it was just after Christmas where, you know, being, you know, the really intense training and mm-hmm. you know, watching the diet and all that goes out the window for a week and a half and um, got out there fine. Um, I started to fall apart pretty quickly on the way back and really struggled. It took about 12 hours. Wow. And I remember the last sort of 16, 18 Ks just being quite miserable Oh. Um, it was a great sense of achievement to, to finish it, but I, I really, I was really, really hurting. Like my legs absolutely felt on fire. 
coming down Barron Pass, my knees just, I, I, they felt like I was 90 years old with arthritis. Wow. Um, and, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty, pretty close to, <laughs> to breaking, but there's no way out, you know, yeah. other than, you know, call an EPIRB, uh, you know, press the yeah. button on the PLB, um, which is, you know, a, a, a big thing to do. Um, you know, and as trail runners doing a, you know, a five day mm. hike, you know, you're going to be the silly buggers who decided you could do this yeah. in a day. You better prove that you can. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it was probably, probably just stubbornness that, that gets you through in the end, but um, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that came pretty close, <laughs> but uh, it obviously didn't scare me off. <laughs> <laughs> obviously not. You obviously recovered and were able to put yourself back together again enough to be able yeah. to keep going. And, and keep doing it and keep turning up. Um, what are you thinking about when you're out? Because you have, it's an interesting question to ask ultra people, but also people like yourself who spend a lot of time just walking, bushwalking, hiking. Um, what do you, what kind of things are going through your mind when you're out there? Doesn't have to um, be specific. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, just probably thinking about the, the, the issues buzzing through my head normally. I am. Um, I'm a big thing on uh, I'm a stickler for not running with music or bushwalking yep. with music, mm-hmm. um, mostly for safety issues. Um, obviously, mm-hmm. it's 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 dangerous in urban environments. It's um, it's dangerous on the road, and I also think it's a bit dangerous when you're actually out bush as well, mm-hmm. because you know if someone's calling out to you, you mm-hmm. can't hear them. And there's also sort of a, an idealistical view that you're out bush you should be listening to the sounds of nature and enjoying yeah. that and resetting and all of that rather than you know listening to you know whatever music um so i'm just usually there working through my thoughts um yeah. occasionally you do run out of things to worry about and <laughs> you can just sort of zone out whether yeah. I, I don't know whether they call that flow state um, i've heard yeah. the, the term used a bit mm-hmm. but where you can yeah, just sort of empty your mind and just be very, very present in the moment. And that's usually that rare moment where nothing's hurting at that particular time. <laughs> Everything's going well. It tends to happen on a gentle downhill slope. Yes, I um, need that. <laughs> and just everything's working and you just can sort of just look around, enjoy this moment going, this is all right. This is, this is really, really good. This is, this is a good moment. Remember it. Be very, very thankful for it. Yeah. Um, and then invariably you twist your ankle or something like that. Because <laughs> it's <laughs> got to go be back. the yin and the yang, the opposite. And the- <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't last very long. This is why you've got to appreciate it when it's there because, it'll, you know, something will happen, something will start aching. Um, I mean, a lot of the times you, you're you just w- working through, okay, at this particular, you know, when my watch hits 50K, is I'm going to have something to eat? What mm-hmm. am I going to have to eat? I'll get the banana out of my pack. No, that's too far to you know, reach around, I'll grab this instead. <laughs> when am I going to get water again? What am I going to, what am I going to have when I finish? Yeah. I think I'll have the all the base stuff. Isn't this, it? <laughs> this, this is all the stuff that's just buzzing through your head constantly. And then for the last 10 Ks, it's like, God, oh, this is never going to end. This is never going to end. This is never going to end. I think my head goes, when's my, I just can't wait for that cappuccino or that last thing. Yeah. <laughs> Focus on a piece of food or a drink. Or something. How good's that cold can of <laughs> coke or solo (laughs) or something like that or yeah um, yeah, you start you start thinking about other things um i don't know i I suppose one of the things certainly in the longer runs you do go into something of a survival mode Mm -hmm. i do actually appreciate the simplicity of that where like we live we live complicated lives these days Mm. everyone knows Mm -hmm. that and one of the great things about running is that ultimately it's just left foot right foot don't fall over continue Mm -hmm. until you're the end so yeah. it's actually very, very simple and it's all in your hands. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, mm. nobody else can really get in the way, you know, it can rain. Yeah. Um, yeah. You work around that. But um, sort of you're, you're very much in control of your destiny and I mm. really, really appreciate that simplicity of, um, okay, it's going to hurt. It's going to take a long yeah. time. Mm-hmm. But there's absolutely no reasons why I can't get to the finish line because yeah. it's as long as the left foot goes in front of the right foot, goes in front mm. of the left, don't fall over, um, you'll eventually get there. And it's just, I just find that simplicity very attractive. It, it is it, very attractive. I agree. Yeah. I because you don't that. get that 
you know, at work. Yeah. You don't get that in the rest of our lives where we're trying to balance family and, yeah. you know, work and career and, you know, house payments and bills yeah. and everything else. It's all complicated and a lot of it isn't in our control or as much in our control as yeah. we'd like. Yeah. Um, when you're running, it's, it's, it's all you. Mm, that's nicely put there. Thank you, Ben. Um, if you didn't have running in your life, how do you think your life would be? What would you miss be missing out on if you didn't have it? Oh, my God. Um, it, honestly, it's actually hard to imagine yeah. without, without running. Um, I, I, probably the main thing I'd miss is just all the amazing people who yeah. I've met and now mm-hmm. consider, you know, fast and firm friends. Um, all those relationships uh, are worth more than the actual running itself. Yeah. It's almost like the running is actually a byproduct of that. Um, look, it's obviously kind of kind of done much harm for my health, and no. I'm sure. I, I hope again, you know, when I'm in my, in my 70s and um, I can look back and say, yeah, okay, that was you know, in your 30s, you you you, you turned a corner, yeah. and you're still benefiting from that now. Whether I'll be running competitively in my 70s or just going for walks and still mm. being active and, and hopefully still having a reasonable amount of health. Mm. Um, I'd be very appreciative of that. And obviously if I didn't have that, I'd really, really miss it. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a bit hard to, honestly, yeah, it's, it's hard, hard to imagine it without yeah. it, even though it's only been sort of seven, eight years. That's providing um, you with quite a foundation really, isn't it too? Even a leapfrogging it, off into the bushwalking, even though you were doing that before, it's also giving you that, that it complements the bushwalking as well. Yeah. I think it's just that the, the, certainly it makes me appreciate the outdoors and what we have, especially here in Tasmania, mm-hmm. a lot. Like I have ambitions. I, I want to spend some more time over in New Zealand and, and mm-hmm climb Mount Cook over there. That's sort of my, my Everest, my big bucket. Yep. List. <laughs> Hopefully I'll do in the next, well, say five years. Um, and I want to spend some more t- time, you know, through the Australian Alps and, and, and other places as well. But um, it's made me really appreciate just what we've got here mm. and to be very, very thankful for what we've got here um, mm. to appreciate it, to protect it, to make sure it's there for, um you know, future generations mm. and to make sure that the people who are about now know it's there, appreciate yeah. it and can care for it as well. You should work for like Tourism Tasmania and be there, <laughs> a, an ambassador. <laughs> not sure about that. Because <laughs> like, yeah, you've said so much about how much, especially our not built environment, our natural environment and your love for that and appreciation for it. So A lot of that I actually owe to my partner. Tracy, yeah. um, she wasn't born in Australia. Uh, she, she was born overseas and in, in, in quite a, a bad environment. So her and her family have a very strong appreciation for, for our country and oh, don't take it for granted in the way that I think. Most of us do. Mo- most, well, I, as a, someone who's a seventh or eighth generation mm. um, Australian on at least two sides, um, you know, I think we, we take a little bit too much of it for granted. Mm. Um, and, um, yeah, to, to, to sort of be reminded of that has actually made me be more appreciative and actually to stop and go, no, wait, mm. what we've got here is quite special. This is not, and, and I think maybe, um, everything with the lockdowns and the pandemic over the last couple of years, you know, when Melbourne, you know, I've got friends in Melbourne who've mm-hmm. been stuck in a five kilometer bubble in the endless suburbs all around there and not able to see family and living alone and all that. And, you know, we had this minor lockdown where I could yeah. go to the local, you know, Heritage Forest is literally a stone's throw away from um, our house. And, um, you know, I could do five kilometre laps around there. I could go into the gorge. Um, you know, we weren't really struggling. We've got so many nice places here. And, um, you know, and obviously when the, the, the parks opened up again, it was like, you know, drive an hour away and we can, you know, social distancing, no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll go over, over there, um, walk for two days in that direction and have nobody there. Um, it's unique. It's not common throughout well, most of the Western world anyway. Yeah. So um, 
we're pretty lucky. And as I've got older, I've probably gained more of an appreciation of that than mm. probably Ben in his 20s ever acknowledged. Yeah. Is that interesting? I love it. I agree with it wholeheartedly, as you know. <laughs> I love getting out there as well. Um, is there anything about running that we haven't talked about that you think we should have? Oh, I think I've, I think I've waffled on for way too long already. So no, you've been um, very inspiring. I think everybody will be grabbing their backpack and heading out the door, <laughs> having a walk. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Um, no, look, I think as you, as you said, everyone's experience is different. Um, it's it's very much a community, and I think, um, I mean. Running is something that really all you need to do is grab a pair of shoes and yeah. you know, a pair of shorts or whatever and, and just run. And that's the beauty of it. It's very, very simple. It's not like, say, like mountain biking, for example, where you can always have a better, more expensive bike. Nobody's better pair of shoes has suddenly yeah. turned them into Usain Bolt. It's all on you. So it's yeah. a great equaliser in that regard. Um, and whether or not you care about your times, whether or not you care about racing, whether or not, um, you know, you want to get into that competitive side or not, there is an amazing community there. And mm. whether you do it to actually use it as a way to, to, to sort of keep you honest, keep you on the straight and narrow, yeah. like, you know, going to your, your run group to, you know, once a week or, um, you know, joining a social run. Um, it's just a wonderful community of people and everyone almost universally is just happy to see other people succeed. Mm. Um, there's always people who are going to be faster than you. There's always people who are going to be slower than you. Um, and it's, so you, I mean, really you're only competing against yourself. Mm -hmm. For myself, I've, I found being quite competitive was good for me because it, yeah. it kept me focused. Um, but I wouldn't say that should be universal. Mm. Um, you know, I know people who just go out and they're happy to pot along and they don't care whether or not they were 10 seconds faster than last year or not. Mm. Um, and I think over time, certainly I've, I've noticed with myself, I, I'm start caring less now. I used to be very yeah. numbers <laughs> obsessed. And um, whereas now I just go out and do it for the enjoyment. And if I set a particular target, that's just me just trying to motivate myself and keep myself mm. honest. Um, but definitely plug into the community as much as you feel comfortable because there's a ton of knowledge there and there's a ton of motivation and a ton of support. So even, you know, if someone's, um, you know, sort of, oh, you know, I just want to, I just want to lose weight. I just want to, mm -hmm. you know, get, be, be fitter, um, which was me you know, yeah. back seven, eight years ago. Yeah. Um, just wanted to be less fat and, and you know, be, be fitter. Um, I, I kind of wish I hadn't wasted sort of seven months before actually joining a running group yeah. because uh, I, I, I could have got that much better, that much faster by having mm. all these people around with, with advice and, and motivation. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it's just, there for the taking i guess you know that would be that would probably be my my one bit of advice yeah. is that yeah plug yourself into the community as, as as soon as you feel comfortable yeah and um embrace it as much as you as much as you can so would that would be your advice for a beginner runner like getting start to get started and to find that community that works for you that you click with i think so yeah um look it's it's more fun with other people yeah. honestly <laughs> like you know running in the dark trying to get 6ks in before work in the middle of winter <laughs> honestly isn't that fun uh, if you're that stubborn then all power to you um but i tell you what um misery loves company and if you can find two other people who will yell at you if you're late because you're trying <laughs> to get out of it then ultimately it's going to be better for you because you're going to get out there <laughs> you know, you can complain about the weather together, but you'll, you'll get into it and um, actually enjoy, uh, enjoy the training and enjoy the process uh, a lot more. And it'll just open you up to more opportunities as well mm. and options, whether it's, you know, um, racing. I mm. mean, had I, had I not um, got in touch with, uh, with Jono and Amy 
all those years ago, I, I never would have known. Like it was like literally opening up this entire yeah. new world. Um, and that all came through just that, that one meeting and uh, one little training session in the park of a Thursday afternoon. Amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> as, as I said, I mean, I, I can understand that a lot of people, I can, they might feel a bit nervous um, mm-hmm. or apprehensive. And I'd say like, probably the other thing is like if people don't feel oh, i don't feel i'm good enough mm. to go to a running group honestly most runners i know uh they're not athletes you know yeah. they don't take it seriously all they're trying to do is in, is improve yesterday you yeah. know they want to be a little bit better than they were yesterday um you know they're the sorts of people who take 30 40 minutes to do park run yeah um you know they're um but they're still out there having fun. They're still trying to improve themselves. So, and if you want to be one of those people, like don't feel like you're going to be the, you know, the slow duck. Mm. There's always someone going to be slower. Yeah. And I tell you what, they'd be happy for the company as well. So that's true. Um, yeah. Don't be, don't, don't feel like you, you need to get up to a certain level before you before can join yeah. in. Yeah. I yeah. love that. In fact, a lot of the groups that we know of you and I, they actually have people who mostly walk, whether they're walking exactly. because they're coming back from an injury or they're just at a time in their life where that's more comfortable for them right now. Um, so they just or their friends are the runners and they just want to come and be part of it and they decided they walk. And then, mind you, often they become runners, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> walkers yeah. who became runners. But, yeah, you don't have to. Or they run walk, or the they walk run. I mean, walk running yeah. is honestly, I mean, uh, I, I remember, you know, I, there, there were a couple of aborted attempts for me actually running in my late twenties, where I, I tried things like the couch to five k yeah. or variations of those things, where you're doing that sort of interval training. I mean, interval training is a key part of sort of any form of fitness, mm-hmm. especially for running. Um, and even at sort of the more ambitious end of the sport, we're still doing intervals. We're just doing faster yeah. sprints and that sort of thing, yeah. or going up hills. Um, Run walking is great. I mean, you know, if you're at the point where you want to be a runner, but you can literally only run for 30 seconds at a time and then need a couple of minutes to to walk, there are tons of people who are in the exact same boat. Mm -hmm. And again, they'd love some company and they'd love somebody there to motivate them through the last five Mm -hmm. seconds uh, where it's really starting to hurt, Mm -hmm. Um, um, to share in the experience and, you know, keep you honest when the weather's mm. not not as night not motivating <laughs> and yeah so it's um I, the community is probably the most addictive and rewarding part of running which is oh, yeah. a, a weird thing because it's a, a an aside yeah but um like i suppose you know if i didn't run tomorrow that would suck but if I didn't have the community tomorrow, that would be a tragedy. That would be awful. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. You know what? I have kept you way too long on what is the last day of your holidays. <laughs> <laughs> but it has been an awesome conversation, Ben. I really have enjoyed it. And I know that everyone will get lots of lots and lots out of it, including I think you've made people, especially if they're in Tasmania, that they will want to get out and go <laughs> for a walk or run in the bush. If they're not in Tassie, then they're probably booking tickets to get here. <laughs> so that they can I think everybody them. is already now that the borders are all open now. <laughs> I know there's a, I've probably counted about four dozen camper vans out on the road yesterday yep. afternoon. So. <laughs> it's amazing. So anyway, I do appreciate it. Thank you for sharing your time with us. And as I said, it is the last day of your holiday. So thank you. I'm glad you got a walk in yesterday anyway. So <laughs> Again, thanks thank for you. Sure. Thanks for being with us. Don't go anywhere because I'll talk to you off the recording as well. <laughs> no worries. Thank you for listening to the Fit Mind Fit Body Podcast. I'd love to talk to you about your running journey. Send me a message on Facebook or on the website and let's do it. I also wanted to let you know that I've created an email list so you won't miss any podcast episodes. You'll find details in the show notes and on the Fit Mind Fit Body website, along with a bunch of resources on mindful running. They'll help you to get and stay mentally and physically fit. And I'll see you there. Plus, I'll be back here in your podcast player a few times a week. 
hit subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And before you go, I'd really appreciate it if you would leave a review. It'll help more people to find the podcast and get inspired to start running and ultimately to improve their life. See you soon.